much, Chris. Um, I've already uh, broken the first rule of giving a talk like this, which is always to wear a piece of clothing with a pocket if you're going to be recorded. <laughs> so I have this strange device that I'm now tethered to, and uh, I'm going to leave it there and see what happens. It may all go horribly wrong. Um, the second rule, of course, is that I hope I can hold your attention for the next 40 minutes or so, and then um, we'll have questions and discussion. Um, there's a, a, a nice story I was told about a, a woman looking out across a crowded lecture hall halfway through her talk and saying, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm not wearing a watch. I don't know if anybody can tell me how things are going. And somebody pipes up from the back, you may not have a watch, but there's a calendar on the wall behind you. <laughs> so my hope is that in the next 40 minutes or so, I'll take you on a bit of a journey about patient involvement in research, what it is, um, why we do it, uh, how it's done, and how we can involve you, if you would like to be involved. Um, and also some key questions and challenges, and there are lots of them. This is by no means a, a, a simple area, and it's a relatively new science as well. But I think it's important to start with a definition. So what we're talking about here, patient involvement in research, is about involving patients in uh, planning research, essentially. So it's research being carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about or for them. So it's not about joining trials or joining studies as subjects. It's about being involved in research planning as a partnership with research professionals. Now, the eagle-eyed among you will have spotted that this definition, which is from INVOLVE, which is the, the NIHR, you'll hear that acronym, you'll see it tonight. It's the National Institute of Health Research. It's essentially the NHS funding, research funding arm, their definition uses the word public. The title of my talk used the word patient. Um, there's a lot of debate about terminology in the world of, and I will call it, I'll use the acronym now, PPI, patient and public involvement. There's lots of debate. What are, who are we talking about? Are we talking about the public? Are we talking about patients? Are we talking about lay people? Are we talking about users? Are we talking about consumers? Who's actually involved? As I've said earlier, the key thing is about partnership. And the second key thing is about appropriateness for the role. So to give you an example, a member of the public, somebody who doesn't identify themselves necessarily at the moment as a patient, can have a very valuable role in, for example, looking at an information leaflet or a clinical trial recruitment information and say, it doesn't make sense. And they can do that whether or not they've got the condition that is being dealt with by the, 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 the piece of writing. And that's very useful as a sort of jargon buster. And that's about doing it in retrospect, but of course it's better to do it from the beginning. If you're going to write an information leaflet, it's probably a good idea to start by involving some people who aren't embedded in the world of research or, uh, or, or medical care and treatment that you're involved in. So get them online as your jargon buster. Patient involvement is about something a bit different kind of as the name defines really, it's about people who've had specific experiences of certain conditions getting involved because of that, because they are experts in that area through their own experiences. Now, I kind of labour that definition a bit and you may be thinking, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? We're all much of a muchness and I, I often sit in meetings where we're thinking, oh, we need to get some patients in the public on this and I think, well, I'm patients in the public when I'm not sitting in this meeting, so what's all the fuss about? I had a meeting quite recently with some people from the Health Research Authority, the HRA, who are, which is the, the organisation which is now essentially responsible for uh, dealing with, with the whole regulation of research in this country. And they had done a rather interesting survey and I came away from the meeting with them thinking, I think at last I may be a little bit exonerated in minding about this so much. They had done some focus groups with the public and with patients. In the first group, they'd talked to people who didn't identify themselves as patients, and the, they had said, the public, they didn't have any understanding of PPI, and they didn't think it was useful. This was extraordinary. They said they were suspicious of lay members serving on ethics committees, and what they wanted was experts. And that's really interesting, because a third of all, lay, a third of all sorry, on ethics committees, a third of all ethics committees are lay people. So that was a, a very interesting finding. But the patients in their focus group said, there's not enough PPI going on out there, and we really want the HRA to take a greater role in promoting it. So I think, as I've said, it's about the right people for the, for the, the appropriate people for the appropriate jobs, but it is sometimes important to recognise that there is a difference between public involvement and patient involvement. But, as I've said, I will probably slip into using the PPI acronym. In fact, it crops up right now. 
a little bit of context. Where, where did this all spring from? We weren't doing any of this stuff. Even 10 years ago, we weren't doing much of it. The mental health service user movement was very much one of the origins. I worked in mental health about 15, 20 years ago, and at that time, it's very understandable why the, the, the foundations of this perhaps lie there. If, you're, if you have a condition where you may be treated against your will, you may be treated with medication that you don't feel is appropriate, that makes you feel absolutely dreadful, it's quite likely that you will want to have a say in your care. And it's quite likely that you will then want to have a say in the research that underlies your care. So the mental health service user movement was really where a lot of this stuff began. Coming up to date, uh, the Health and Social Care Act in 2012, um, an interesting uh, title of the consultation document, which was called Liberating the NHS, No Decision About Me Without Me. It also embedded research in the NHS and it enabled a greater voice for patients. So PPI is there, enshrined really, in the title of that document. And then the National Institute for Health Research, the NIHR, very much there, a very strong commitment to the importance of PPI. So the NIHR sees PPI as vital in the research pro process and demonstration of PPI at every stage of a research proposal is a prerequisite of an NIHR funding award. For those of you in this room who have NIHR funding awards or hope to have, it's an important piece of information. Um, every stage means, as I was saying at the beginning, it's about involving patients in deciding what research is done, how to do it, what to do with the results, and all the various complicated and, and tricky bits in the middle. So that's a very firm statement from the research funding bit of the NHS, and it's backed up by comments of this sort. So this was uh, Professor Dame Sally Davis, our Chief Medical Officer, who makes an extremely strong statement here about however complicated the research is or how brilliant the researcher, patients and the public always offer unique and invaluable insights. And she goes on to list several things that they can achieve or that can be achieved by PPI. I'll come back to this definition a little bit later. It's great, but it's important that statements like that lie in an evidence base. And the reason I say that is that the people who are working and having to incorporate PPI in their daily life are people who, on the whole, are used to doing things based on the evidence. So it's important that we dissect statements like this and we say, OK, we need to show the evidence or get some evidence for it. Just two last slides to show you a little bit of the context of PPI. They look horrible and complicated, but I'll just whiz through them so that you can see the scale of the activity that we're talking about here. So the NIHR spends about a billion pounds a year on research. It's a lot of money. Involve, you saw their definition earlier on. It's the National Advisory Group which supports PPI. The Clinical Research Network is the infrastructure within which res uh, clinical trials are happening. The NIHR Evaluation Trials and Studies Coordinating Centre, NETCC. You'll hear a little bit more about that later because it's very involved with some work that's happening here in Oxford. The Central Commissioning Facility is quite important. It's one of the arms of the NIHR, which is responsible for managing the contracts for the biomedical research centres and the biomedical research units. So people like me are overseen, looked after by people at the CCF. So it's important that we work with them on our PPI. There's then the network of regional research design services which who will give advice to people wanting to apply for money and one of the things they'll advise on is PPI. And then lots and lots and lots of local and regional groups doing their own things. When I came into post in Oxford I realised how important it was to try and get a picture of what's going on here across the patch because we've got the, the BRC, the Biomedical Research Centre, the Biomedical Research Unit, the Academic Health Science Network, Clinical Research Networks, everybody's doing bits of PPI and it's really important to track it and I'll come in a moment on to why we're doing an, an audit, really, of, uh, of who's doing what here. The second context slide is moving a little bit wider than the NIHR, although, in fact, the first thing here, the UK Cochrane Centre. So the Cochrane Centre is part of the NIHR, and it's the home, if you like, of systematic reviews. Systematic reviews are essentially the basis on which evidence-based healthcare is provided. So they're reviews of what works best for what, for whom, and in which circumstances. And they have a consumer network. NICE, probably all heard of NICE, weighs up the, the benefits of healthcare um, and, their cost, and its cost effectiveness. They have a PPI panel and have had since 1999. The Medical Research Council has a public panel. 
And that's also an interesting organisation. The Medical Research Council also is a, is a government funding arm of medical research, but further towards the basic science end than, than the, the translational end, the, the patient benefit end, if you like. But they have been funding some work into a project called PIAF, which is the Public Involvement Impact Assessment Framework. So even though public involvement isn't perhaps a core activity for them, they're very interested in why it's uh, spreading and how you can evaluate its impact. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Association of Medical Research Charities, where I used to work. Interesting expenditure. It's about the same as the NIHR. It's about a billion pounds a year. Uh, 124 member charities they had when I was there. Um, PPI, absolutely integral to the work of some of them. So the Alzheimer's Society, for example, has an initiative called Quality Research in Dementia, and that was really where PPI began and, has now, and from which it has now spread across the charity sector. And there are lots of other charities doing similar sorts of things. But the Alzheimer's Society doesn't give away a penny in research grants without it going through their, their panel of people who have Alzheimer's or other dementias or their carers. So it's very integral to them. In 2010, the AMRC produced a, a, a challenge for government document, um, one part of which highlighted the importance of working with patients to address, uh, working with patients to identify research that addresses their <coughs> needs. So a pretty, pretty strong gauntlet thrown down by the charity sector to say this stuff is important as well. Pharmaceutical devices and biotech industry, I really struggle with this one because the partnership between medical research, whether it's NIHR funded, funded by medical research charities, any of these other activities, is incredibly important. We're doing clinical trials, we're working with industry, we're working with the biotech industry and so on. I have regular conversations with people from industry about PPI in their world. And of course they have a very different imperative. They are about making profits for their shareholders, but they are also producing products which they need to get tested. People need to test them, people need to use them. The last summary that I read of uh, PPI in, in industry was an interesting comment from Patient View, and in their annual report they stated, the fundamental flaw seems to be that companies remain overly product focused in any dealings with patient groups and still do not truly see the world from a patient perspective. The word opaque is what tends to crop up when you talk to people about PPI in industry, and I think it's a really interesting and important area to get to grips with, because we do have strong partnerships with industry. I think we need to work together to see that there might be some, some benefit um, in integrating uh, PPI in the work that they do. The last thing on the list here is the James Lind Alliance. That was funded by the Medical Research Council and the Department of Health and is now uh, in-house at NetCC, which you saw on an earlier slide, one of the operating arms of the NIHR. And I'm going to be talking about that in detail a little bit later because it's part of uh, the sort of three-stranded plan of activity that we've got going on here in Oxford. So what are we doing here in Oxford? This is one of those slides with whizzy animation and I always forget to press the buttons and then nothing appears on the screen. So, James Lind Alliance Partnerships. A dedicated website with and for patients. Um, our three-stranded plan is actually a three-and-a-bit-stranded plan, and I mentioned the importance earlier of doing the audit about who's doing what PPI here in Oxford. The reason that's important is because the website that we're going to be setting up is a place where we're hoping to essentially matchmake research teams that are wanting to involve patients in their research and patients who want to get involved. So we need to find out what people are doing, get it on the website, and then get patients to look at it and say, this is where we'd like to be involved, these are areas that interest us. So that's why we've got a, 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 the plan to do this audit. Um, and the third strand of our work is around metrics, a very um, posh word for measuring stuff. Does patient involvement make research better? And to me, that's kind of the core question, really. That's the most important thing about, uh, 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 in a way, it's the most important thing about PPI. We shouldn't be doing it if it doesn't work. But of course, the definitions of work and the ways to measure it are extremely complex, which I shall, I shall touch on. Um, so the James Lind Alliance, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about them because they're a piece of PPI that's been going on in Oxford now for um, a little while. But a short history lesson, I thought, before we started. So why is it, people often say to me, why is it called the James Lind Alliance? It seems such an odd name. Nobody's heard of him. So James Lind was a Scottish naval surgeon. He was seen as an early pioneer of clinical trials largely because he understood the importance of the things that we now take for granted in trials. So random allocation of similar people living in the same bit of the ship, eating the same diet, to six different daily treatments over 14 years. 
Uh, sorry, 14 days, 14 years. That would be a nice long trial. Um, although some do. I thought as we were sort of appropriately far between lunch and supper, I could probably get away with reading you, just for fun, what the treatments were. 1.1 litres of cider, 25 millilitres of dilute sulfuric acid, two patients each to these, 18 millilitres of vinegar three times a day before meals. I have no idea why he thought any of these things were going to work. Half a pint of seawater, a medicinal paste made up of garlic, mustard seed, dried radish root and gum myrrh. And interestingly, two oranges and one lemon, but they only did that one for six days because they ran out. <laughs> but the rest, as they say, is history. So we've got a Scottish naval surgeon in the 18th century. What, what, what's that, why, why is that relevant to what we're doing here in Oxford? Uh, the reason is that he gave his name to the James Lind Alliance because the James Lind Alliance is all about uh, the, it's about the bedrock to doing good clinical research and clinical trials, if you like. As I say, it used to be funded by the Medical Research Council and the Department of Health. It's now housed, broadly speaking, within NetCC. It's been running for about a decade. Um, and what it does is it brings together groups of patients and carers and groups of clinicians to agree together on what are the most important questions in the most important research questions, strictly speaking in treatment uncertainty, although that definition is getting broader. Um, and the way they do that is through sending out surveys, online questionnaires, that kind of thing, and gathering in what people say, are, patients and carers and clinicians say are, as far as they're concerned, the important unanswered questions in certain areas. The James Lind Alliance specifically excludes in, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, or people who are only doing research. It involves, of course, a lot of uh, people who are doing clinical work and research, but not pure researchers. Um, and the reason is uh, that there is evidence that the research agenda becomes very biased, or has, has been in the past not as useful as it might be, because it has been set by those groups, rather than by asking people at the sharp end, patients, carers and clinicians. For example, there is a study that underpinned the setting up of the JLA back in 2000, which was a study into research on the management of osteoarthritis of the knee. Quite a, quite a major problem. The pharmaceutical industry were funding lots of trials into anti-inflammatory drugs. Patients were saying that what they wanted was study into physiotherapy, surgery, education and coping strategies. I apologise in advance now. I'm going to show you two slides that have got graphs on them which I think is always quite an unkind thing to do, especially at this time in the evening. But I think they're pretty striking. So this is the Talon study in The Lancet that underlay the work of the James Lind Alliance. And it's just so clear here, the trials that were being done are in blue, the patient priorities are in red. They were all into drugs. Patients wanted knee replacement, education advice, and miscellaneous others. There weren't any happening into those. Um, so a pretty clear example there of a mismatch between what matters to people at the sharp end and what was being done. I apologise, I said there'd be two. Here's the second one. This is with thanks to Sally Crow and Ian Chalmers, who are very integral parts of the James Lind Alliance. And these are examples of actual priorities that are coming through. I think this is a, a summary of, a, of 10 or 12 James Lind Alliance partnerships. We've so far done them into about, I think, 17 or 18 conditions. I'll come back to that. But here, again, a very clear example. So in green, education and training, service delivery, psychological, physical, exercise, complementary diet, and other things. If you do a James Lind Alliance priority setting partnership, you overwhelmingly get a desire for research in those areas. Registered non-commercial trials are a bit of a mix. Registered commercial trials, perhaps unsurprisingly, drugs, vaccines, and biologicals very clear illustration of this mismatch. So to move on from there, why might the JLA be a good thing? Why might it lead to better research? So obviously, we've seen that research often overlooks what matters to patients and clinicians. Pretty obvious to kind of to try and write that. The drug and technology industries have priorities that differ. JLA identified priorities increasingly of interest to research funders. That's um, a very pragmatic reason why doing JLA partnerships might matter. If you want to get your research funded and you do a JLA PSP, Priority Setting Partnership, you are likely to get interest from 
uh, both uh, government funders and increasingly from the charity sector. The charities, charities are increasingly involved in JLA partnerships, both as partners in the partnerships and as funders of the work that comes from them. Uh, in some uh, JLA partnerships, all 10 of the top 10 priorities have been funded and research is taking place into those priorities. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big hit. Uh, the JLA has now, I said earlier, 17 or 18. It's worked, the JLA to date actually has worked on 17 conditions, um, from asthma to schizophrenia, eczema, vitiligo, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, we've now got two JLA partnerships underway in Oxford. And it's very nice actually to see some people here tonight who are involved in them. It's lovely to see you. Um, the first one that we started was actually based here and at the bottom in, on hip and knee replacement. And the second is in spinal cord injury. We've got 11, I, 11 more pending looks a bit grand. That was just me looking at my list, my chaotic list of people who've said we really want to do JLA partnerships. Um, 11 more, it might, be, it might be 22, I can't remember, but it's around that. Um, it's a lot of interest here in doing it. Um, health talk online modules. Okay, so the reason that that um, is mentioned here is that we have a resource here in Oxford. So the Biomedical Research Centre funds um, Louise Lowcock, who is here, who is our Health Experiences um, Research Fellow. And she is involved with uh, Health Talk Online. What Health Talk Online does is it creates modules of patient experience. So either on, and it's got about, I don't know, probably more than 100 now, I'm not sure how many there are. I'm sure Louise could tell us later. Um, but a lot of modules on uh, specific diseases, conditions, and dile healthcare dilemmas, if you like. And what we found is that when we do a JLA partnership, as I said earlier, we, we gather people's uncertainties through surveys and questionnaires and so on. What we found is that where we have Health Talk Online modules, it's useful to go back and look at the stories that patients have told us through those modules and mine them, so sift through them, for uncertainties. And we actually found when we did that for the schizophrenia James Lynn partnership that we picked up two uncertainties through sifting back through interviews with patients about their experiences that actually identified two uncertainties that hadn't come through any of the surveys and they ended up in the top 10 that the patients, carers and clinicians said were of the most importance to them. So actually I think we're, we're increasingly looking at when we do a JLA PSP, can we, if there is Health Talk Online material from this huge wealth of qualitative data, can we also identify some uncertainties through that? As I said, we've got the two that we're funding here. We are actually funding a, a, a couple more, but we're also in the process of setting up, in conjunction with NetCC, as I mentioned earlier, the home of the JLA, we're setting up an in-house hub. So we're going to have some people working here who will actually help us to manage and run these partnerships, because they're quite complicated. They take about 18 months to do, um, and we're very keen to have a, a, a sort of, it's a little bit of a satellite of what NetCC is doing. So we're working with them to set that up. Look out for posters appearing on walls if we, when we get other PSPs up and running, because that's one of the ways in which uncertainties are gathered. You'll see, you'll see them being advertised. Um, and if you're interested, have a look at the website. If you're interested in the principles, sign up to the JLA as, a, as an affiliate. It will cost you nothing. You will get regular updates from them about what's happening where. Um, and it's a way of kind of illustrating that, demonstrating um, that you think on the whole, in principle, it's quite a good idea. So the JLA is the first thing that we're up to. The second thing I've already mentioned a little bit, our website. It's on the catchy name of Patients in Research in the Thames Valley. I don't like it, but I can't think of a better one at the moment. The idea behind this is, as I said earlier, it's about auditing who's doing what in PPI and then finding a way to matchmake researchers wanting to involve patients with patients who want to get involved. Um, we'll be covering the region that is covered by the Academic Health Science Network. The AHSN is essentially an umbrella organisation of which many of us and the local trusts in the Thames Valley region and universities and so on are members. And the idea behind that really is that it's, uh, it, it's, it's nice to incorporate all of the local activity that's going on, get it all in one place. With and for patients, that's important. I don't want just to decide that I think I know how this website should look, so I'll set it up and I'll write it and I'll provide the content and I'll tell people what I think. The important thing about this is that we do it with patients and for patients. So, as I'll tell you in a moment, we're in the process of setting up a group. There's information at the front there. 
to which we are trying at the moment to recruit some patients. Once we've done that, we'll be moving forward to probably take from that group some people who can help us with the website and its structure and, and function, if you like. The last of the three strands that I mentioned is metrics. Does this stuff work? We're doing all this work. Does it actually make research better? Does it make any difference? Uh, why do PPI at all? Can you measure its impact? Um, I can't answer that question yet. No, I can. But we have some answers which I shall um, share with you. We have also just appointed a research fellow who will be starting in February next year, who will be specifically focusing on research into the evaluation of PPI. Um, and that feels like a very important step for us, and I think it's a, a bit of a first. So before looking at the evidence for impact, let's just look back about why we're doing this stuff. So our chief medical officer tells us that it invariably makes studies more effective, more credible, and often more cost-efficient as well, so that's a pretty good reason for doing it. It's right. You often hear that argument. And you hear that argument in part because people say, well, we pay for it. This is a billion quid of government money a year. It's a billion quid coming out of the charities. We should have a say in how that money is spent. The it's right uh, argument for doing PPI is an interesting and complex one. And we also have a BRC PPI ethics fellow, Mark Sheehan, who does a lot of work in this area. Then there's the common sense argument. It's common sense. Um, research is for patients. Let's involve patients. It has unexpected consequences. I, I wanted to put this one in um, because this really stems from discussions with people who've been involved in uh, PPI from the clinician perspective. So, for example, um, uh, in our schizophrenia partnership, we had a clinician who is used to seeing patients. He had never worked with them in this way before to try and identify treatment uncertainties and to be really in a room discussing very much in a partnership way what sort of things mattered most to his patients. It's just not what happens uh, or what was typically happening in his clinical consultations. And he said that the conversations he had with patients in that arena dramatically changed his clinical practice. He hadn't realised what sorts of things were of greatest concern to his patients before he'd sat down and talked to them in that sort of environment. So it had the unexpected consequence of changing his clinical practice. It helps those who are involved. There's lots of evidence that shows that people, patients who get involved in research, in the ways we've been discussing, gain personal benefit from it. And in a way linked to that, perhaps, that it enriches, it enriches society. Those are all the reasons why. Might there be reasons why not? There are some quite strong reasons why not, according to the, the world out there. It's a passing phase of political correctness. This was said to me by the editor of a medical journal that will remain nameless when I was trying to get her to publish an article. Um, patients don't have useful opinions about what directions research should take. That was a young researcher who said that to me. The last one was a comment that was made by a very well-meaning research nurse. And I, I didn't, when she said it, I thought, I wonder what you're talking about. And then I thought, actually, I knew exactly what she was talking about. Her imperative was keeping her patients going for as long as she possibly could. That was what mattered to her. That was what she'd learned. That was, that was her, her way of being. Um, but didn't recognise that actually sometimes it was about patients saying, it's actually, it's about, it's about a better, shorter life or a different set of priorities. Um, and really that, if you like, that, um, that last example about people not knowing what's best for them illustrates why here in Oxford there's a lot of interest, and we're involved with it here at the BRC, in trying to work with patients on, so um, some of you in the audience will know about PROMS, patient reported outcome measures, so the things that you measure when you're doing studies. There's a growing emphasis now to say patient reported outcome measures aren't actually really up to much, because what they're doing is they're taking an outcome measure, so an end point, an impact, which has been identified as important by a researcher, and then getting patients to measure it. What we actually need to do is to get patients to identify or generate the outcome measures themselves, and then measure them. So we're moving from PROMs, patient reported outcome measures, to PIOMs, patient identified outcome measures, or patient generated outcome measures, but PGOMs is slightly less gainly, it's an acronym. Um, so we've seen lots of arguments about why we might do PPI, and we've seen some arguments about why we might not do it. Uh, perhaps it's because there is this dichotomy that the need to evaluate it is particularly important. There are really, 
well, there are many arguments around why you might evaluate it. The first one, perhaps, is the most obvious, the effectiveness case. What works? For whom? And in what circumstances? What sort of PPI is the right sort of PPI? The second one is the ethical case. It is possible that PPI is harmful. And the research community has a duty of care. So we need to know that it's not harmful. And the economic case. It takes time. It takes money. It pays people like me. Is it a good use of scarce resources? They're all pretty compelling reasons um, why we need to evaluate PPI. Assuming that we do need to evaluate it, how do we evaluate it? Do we do quantitative evaluation? So the sorts of things that might fall into that would be you do a bit of PPI and then you, uh, in relation to a clinical trial, and then you look at trial recruitment. Has recruitment gone up? Has recruitment gone down? Has recruitment stayed the same? That's a bit of quantitative work. Qualitative, rather more complex. I'll come on to it a little bit later in more detail. At what stage? The at what stage is really important. The um, classic uh, example given for medical research is that it takes 17 years to identify the outcome of any given piece of medical research. That's an awfully long time before we're going to know whether PPI is an important and useful thing to do or not. So at what stage? Probably there are some little incremental stages at which we can actually measure this stuff that will give us some meaningful answers. And I think actually looking back to the graphs I showed you of the JLA work, I think it's pretty clear that a meaningful impact is identifying that the research community may not be doing the stuff that matters to people who've got the condition. So a pretty clear impact there. Um, two lovely acronyms, GRIP and PF. So GRIP is Guidance for Reporting Involvement of Patients and the Public. And this is an ongoing piece of work um, that we're involved in partnering with. So um, it's being led, um, it, in fact, out of the, um, Warwick School of Nursing, among other places. Um, and the reason behind it is that it has been identified that one of the problems with assessing PPI is that it tends to be very badly reported. So if people are doing some research and they've done some PPI, they don't tend to stick it in their methods section. They don't tend to say what they've done, who they've involved, how they involved them, what the aim was, what the outcomes were. So the idea behind GRIP is that just like any other sort of evaluation, if you want to evaluate something, you need to know what was done. So we're working with the GRIP team to try and help them identify what the key points are that we should be saying to researchers, this is what you need to tell us. And hopefully, we'll, you know, we might end up with a, a, a 1A4 side that just says, make sure you report this when you publish your paper. Um, PF, I mentioned earlier, so the, the Public Involvement Impact Assessment Framework. Um, it has a website, pf.org.uk. I don't understand it, a lot of it. But essentially what it is, is it's about developing a framework for measuring the impact of your patient involvement. And we're looking here in Oxford at working with the PF team to take two of our James Lind Alliance priority setting partnerships and run PF alongside them so that we will actually be setting up a framework for measuring. Of course, one has to bear in mind that James Lind Alliance partnerships aren't only about PPI because they're about involving clinicians as well as patients and carers, but they are partly about PPI and we might be able to use PF to identify some impact um, and some impact assessment methods. It is a little bit more complicated than that, though, because I've just told you about the arguments for and against, and then therefore we need to evaluate it, and there are lots of ways of evaluating it, and we've got a research fellow, and everything will be all right, because soon we'll know whether it works. But there's a catch, funnily enough. PPI is about partnership. It's not just about people. I have a medical research background. I've worked in PPI. But it's actually not just about people like me deciding about how you evaluate this stuff. PPI itself needs to be part of deciding how we do the research into impact. Deciding which impacts matter most. We actually need to know from patients what are the impacts of involving them in research that are most important to them, that would make them get involved again. Is it about clear information leaflets? Is it about other things? And developing how to measure them. So that was really sort of summed up at the bottom. That, uh, th th this, is a, this is a pretty new research agenda, this whole idea of researching the impact of PPI, and we need to incorporate PPI in developing that agenda. We're not totally in the dark about the impact of PPI. Two main studies. It's not great. It's not a lot of studies. 
Um, there are lots of others, but these are the two that are most often cited and are the most robust, if you like. So the first one was a literature review that was carried out in 2009. The second one was an international systematic review um, carried out rather more recently. And as you can see there, there are some pretty obvious impacts. So changes trial design, improves recruitment, makes outcome measures meaningful. That was what I was mentioning earlier about PROMs and PIOMs. Makes research ethically acceptable. So if patients are involved, on the whole, other patients want to get involved because they will see it as ethically acceptable to others. And it widens research topics. We've seen that. That is very, very clear. Of course, the question remains, does doing research into those widened and different topics ultimately lead in 17 years to patient benefit? Some questions I can't answer just yet. Um, but these studies also did reveal quite a lot of challenges. So perhaps unsurprisingly, there were a lot of examples and instances where researchers were taking a tokenistic approach to PPI. As I said earlier, I'm not too surprised, and in a way I'm not too worried about it, because I think a lot of that is about people who are used to working in this evidence-based world suddenly being asked to do something that's kind of a bit woolly, really. Um, there was a lot of discussion about instances where um, researchers and patients tussled with whether patient involvement was making research less robust. So that's a bit of a tension and that, that really still goes on. Um, and whether patients kind of water down study design in such a way that it becomes less scientific, if you like. Um, and the other area that was a big challenge, and it's not something that we're tackling hugely in Oxford, but it's something I'm interested in, is, is where patients are themselves acting as the researchers. I touched on that earlier in the mental health world, and that can be a really big area of, um, of difficulty and tension. I wanted to just give you very quickly three examples of impact, which aren't actually from the studies that I mentioned earlier, but they're all, I think, quite nice ones. So the first one was a piece of work where PPI gave the thumbs up to some work that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, a group of researchers in multiple sclerosis applied for funding to do a trial, and they were turned down because they were told, you want young, MS, young people with MS to come into clinic and have regular lumbar punctures. Nasty procedure with a needle stuck into the bottom of the spine to take fluid off. I've had them, they're horrible. Um, and the trial wasn't funded. Shift MS is a, is a, a, a web-based community of young people with MS, and they did a bit of research among their patient community and said, there's a trial, it's not going to happen because people don't want, they don't think that people will agree to have these lumbar punctures. And they said, we don't have a problem with having, we're having horrible things done to us all the time. That's not gonna make, it's not going to be any worse than the stuff that happens most of the time. Of course we'll join the trial. So the funders said, OK, I think we got that one wrong, and funded the trial. So that's a very clear example of where patient involvement is actually saying, you've made the wrong decision about this, get on and do it. Thumbs down. Um, this was an interesting study. So this was a, a study which had funding and was all ready to, to go ahead. And the idea behind it, basically, was that a bunch of researchers had said, I think it would be really interesting to compare recruitment with leaflets about the study written by patients and leaflets written by us, the researchers, and we'll compare them and we'll see which of them get better recruitment. The pa they hadn't involved any patients in setting the study up. They got the funding for it. It was all ready to go. And the patients came along and said, this is just ridiculous. We, don't, we, we see this as partnership. We don't want to set the patients against the professionals and have a kind of competition. And what will we do if the answer comes out, it's only the leaflets written by patients that recruit patients? What will then happen? Will we never, write, will we never let a researcher write a leaflet again? So the study stopped. Um, and the authors pointed out, we know very little about ideas that are not developed into research proposals because the public and patients aren't convinced of their value. And I think that's true, and I think it's quite an interesting point to, to think about. Um, and the last one is a really clear bit of impact. So this was a fairly recent study where the portfolio of trials um, being managed by the Mental Health Research Network, 374 studies, <laughs> were essentially... Uh, they were weighed up for the amount of PPI that had been involved in them. And where there was a bit of PPI, recruitment to the trials, and bear in mind that about a third of all trials failed to recruit properly. If you do a bit of PPI, you got recruitment that was 1.63 times better than if you had none. If you did a lot of PPI, you got recruitment that was 4.12 times better. Pretty clear again, involving patients in uh, trial design, um, is on the whole good for recruitment. I laboured quite hard at the beginning this distinction between patients and the public. There is another 
um, little knotty problem, which is not about, about, it's not about terminology, and it's not about, the patient, about patients versus the public, but it's about who do you involve. And it's often termed as the representative patient debate. Who is the, re if you're gonna have a committee and you're gonna get a couple of people to come and sit on that committee, who are you going to choose? How will you choose them? My heart bypass might be different from your heart bypass. What I want from my hip replacement might be different from what you want. So how do we choose who is actually going to come and sit on those committees and what they're going to do? Who can you involve? How best can you do it? And what about the rest? At a simple level, and I've had this discussion with so many people so often, and some people say to me, but surely some patient involvement is better than no patient involvement. Probably true, but we do need to keep in mind the possibilities that we raised earlier, that it might not be effective, it might be a waste of money, and it might be harmful. If we do patient involvement with people like us. So if researchers have patients that they're working with, who they get on with particularly well, and they ask them to join research studies, that is great. It's very important those people bring invaluable insights. But does it risk the research community thinking, well, we've ticked the PPI box, we've involved a patient or two, and actually what they've done is they've disempowered the people who it is harder to bring in and who traditionally don't come to talks like this or volunteer to spend their time um, helping to develop research. Um, I mentioned Health Talk Online earlier. I'm going to mention it again now because there is increasingly the view that just as you will have one or two clinicians on a, on a committee, you are often restricted to only having one or two patients. You can't get round that. We can't have everybody doing everything. But increasingly, the PPI world is recognising that actually, if you are sitting on a committee as a patient representative to bring the patient view, depending what you're there to do, it is perhaps incumbent on you to try and find out a little bit more from other people who are in a similar situation to you about what their views are. So that when you go to the committee meeting next time, you're not just going saying, this is what I think, but you're going saying, I am here in such a way that I can perhaps tell you a little bit about the views and experiences of other people. The Health Talk Online modules, if I had my way, we would always match PPI with a Health Talk Online module. Because we could always say to anybody who sits on a committee that's discussing research into breast cancer, we could always say to them, go and look at the breast cancer module, so that when you come to the next meeting, you will have a really broad range of patient views. What Health Talk Online do is they go on interviewing patients until no new themes are emerging. So it's a really robust piece of qualitative research. And if you as a patient then look at all the various um, video and audio and, and transcript information on the website, you will have a much broader view than if you didn't. We can't match all the PPI we do to Health Talk Online modules because it would be too restrictive to what we're doing, but it's a very important and increasingly um, important way of widening this representative patient um, issue. There's also a, a, an interesting nugget which is being discussed a lot at the moment, which is um, carers as proxies. And of course, we, in the James Lind Alliance, we work with a lot of people who are carers. Um, in children's research, we work with parents as proxies. There is quite a lot of evidence emerging that quite often what parents think their children want isn't what their children want at all, and ditto carers and patients. And actually that's really interesting. Is there a mismatch there? And do we need to find ways of getting a little bit better about being subtle about what those differences might be? I'm going to leave the next slide on the board for quite a long time, but actually, as I say, there are um, some, uh, there's some information at the front here. So as I say, we are looking to try and address these sorts of problems in Oxford by setting up a new group. We spent such a long time working out this acronym. Uh, I can see Louise at the back who's laughing because she remembers the hundreds of emails that went back and forth. Um, PAIR, we thought the PAIR group was really nice. Patients active in research. The group is going to be a group of about 12 or 15 people and the hope is that it will have equal members of patients and clinicians, researchers, medical staff and so on. And we are currently looking for new members and for a lay co-chair, a patient co-chair or public co-chair, whatever you want to call it. As I say, there's information at the front there. Um, please do apply if you'd be interested to be involved. Um, and you've got until the 16th of December to do so. I wanted to touch on one issue in relation to PEAR um, because it's been, a very, it's been a big part of work here in Oxford and it's important. Um, as you've seen, it is essentially national policy that we should involve patients in research. It is also national policy 
that we should pay patients who are involved in research, not just for their expenses if they've had to travel, but actually if you've got a meeting and you've got a bunch of medics and a bunch of researchers and some patients, you should be paying them all to be there. You should pay for their time. We developed a policy here in Oxford. It was all ready to go. There's a really big issue in the middle of all of this, which is that for patients who are on benefits or receiving a pension, receiving payment for involvement, not reimbursement of expenses, that's okay, as long as it happens alone, but being paid for involvement can have hugely damaging consequences for benefit payments. So we're working very hard at the moment to try and solve this. There was a method that was solving it, but that method has, is no longer available to us. And we're working hard with Involve and with NIHR um, to try and solve it. And we hope very much, we had hoped to do it with PEAR, we hope very much it, soon to have a policy which says we do pay patients who are involved and this is our, our method for doing so and these are these were our rates. To sum up, the survey I mentioned earlier from the Health Research Authority that um, summarised the difference between patients and the public so well, um, there's a really nice quote in there from somebody actually on the mental health um, group that they interviewed. Patient involvement in research is like motherhood and apple pie. It cannot be challenged. And I thought, I actually wondered, I thought, I don't really know what motherhood and apple pie means. You hear it all the time and it's, kind of, it's lovely. I mean, what two nicer things? So I looked it up. And the, the definition of motherhood and apple pie, according to somewhere really reliable like Wikipedia, is something that can't be questioned because it appeals to universally held beliefs or values. And I thought, how lovely if it were true. But actually, PPI doesn't really fit into any of those categories. It is challenged. We saw that at the very beginning by the public, who the HRA interviewed, who said, what a terrible idea. It is challenged. It's challenged by some researchers. It isn't universally held, and it is questioned. So actually, I don't think this is entirely true. Not entirely evidence-based, perhaps. I think, it can, I think PPI can be challenged. I think it should be challenged. And that's what we're doing here in Oxford. We're doing it. We're challenging it. We're doing more of it. We're trying to make sure that it's well documented so that you can measure what is done. Um, all talks have to have one cartoon in them. I laboured long and hard over which one I should put in here. But I think for me, this really sums up why we do PPI. Because if we don't, we risk perpetuating a situation perhaps a little like this. And if you want to find me, I can hear you chuckling, so I suspect you've all got to the end of that one. If you want to find me, that's where to do so. And as I say, please, if you do have um, any desire at all to join our pair group, um, pick up a leaflet from the front and, and get in touch before the 16th of December. Thank you very much. I think if you have questions or comments, we would, we would welcome them. Thank you.